Welcome to this lecture on systems thinking. I have posted a couple of lectures that I have used in my classes to introduce systems thinking and as noted on the slide, the main source is really the book, the excellent classic book on systems thinking called Business Dynamics, Systems Thinking and Modeling for a Complex World by John Sturman of MIT. So everything that I'm presenting here, almost everything that I'm presenting here is really taken directly uh, from Sturman's books and perhaps other writings of Sturman. Uh, of course, I am deeply indebted to uh, such a wonderful source of information that Sturman has provided. Okay, so we start off with a small uh, example of systems, of lack of systems thinking really. Uh, the person in the picture is... Uh, uh, Nikolai Ceausescu. He was a dictator in Romania, and uh, he was considered a you know fairly evil kind of dictator. He and his wife both uh, ruled the country with an iron fist for a long time. Now, of course, like all dictators, uh, they want more people to rule over, but the birth rates in Romania were uh, really low, and Ceausescu wanted to get the birth rates up. So you can see here. What happened in Romania was that in the you know, 60s, as you can see here, the birth rate was really low. This is number of children born per thousand uh, per year, right? Uh, per thousand of population per year. You can see the birth rate was just a little bit above 10 uh, in 1966. And it, was, it also had increased a little bit and then declined again in 67. So, choices Q in order to increase the birth rates, put a lot of policies into place, okay? So policies were things like um, outlaw the import of contraceptives, a lot of government propaganda, banning of abortions, and tax incentives for having children, okay? And as you can see, of course, all of these policies had an immediate impact, and within a span of a year or so, you can see that the birth rates really shot up went almost to 40. But then what you see is that the birth rate, that is the impact of these changes did not last and the birth rates constantly started declining, declining, declining um, and pretty much back to the whole level in 71. And in fact, if you look further, it continued to drop and by 94, it was down to really uh, below the level where it started before the incentives. Okay, now this is not an isolated example. This kind of behavior you see in all kinds of situations in various types of systems, economic systems, social systems, business systems, whatever it is. Uh, and the general tendency is you see a problem, you take some measures to fix the problem. The measures seem to be working for a short period of time and then things come back to the original level. Okay, So there's a term that people use to refer to this and that is called policy resistance. Now just think about it. If you really think about it, why was the birth rate so low here? Okay, it's not for some arbitrary reason that it was low. There are a lot of good reasons why people were choosing not to have children. So there are a lot of underlying causes and the, ins the interventions that choices QCs uh, put in place did not seem to have addressed those real main concerns. And as a result, you know, initially, of course, people react to these policies, but slowly they learn to circumvent the effect of all these policies and the underlying factors that were keeping the birth rates low in the first place reassert themselves and things come back to where they were. Okay, so this is what we refer to as policy resistance. So what really happened was that the people, the population, exhibited unanticipated responses, which is unanticipated in the sense of not anticipated by the people who put those corrective, supposedly corrective policies in place and impacts of those uh, unanticipated responses. Okay, 
So people started managing to smuggle contraceptives. You know, there's only so much a government can do to prevent things. There is limited amount of law enforcement and all of those things. So if there's a sufficient amount of force, if there's sufficient amount of dissatisfaction, people will find a way out to handle these issues. Right? And then, of course, they started having back alley, ab back alley abortions, which also meant that because of lack of safety, there were unanticipated deaths. And then, of course, in general, because of, you know, people were choosing not to have children because they were not economically able to support children. Right? So there was the problem of uh, mortality. The, first of all, there were people who were unhealthy. So when they were trying to have children, um, th there was neonatal uh, mortality and then of course infant mortality and so on and so forth okay so clearly as i discussed earlier the steps that the dictator took to increase birth rates ignored the underlying reasons why the birth rates were low in the first place okay and of course there were certain other unanticipated consequences as well because what was happening was that people were having children because of the pressures of the government and all the policies but they were not able to take care of them. So all these children were put into, uh, you know, government-run orphanages. So that you're seeing a picture here of one of the government-run orphanages. And of course, you know, the government didn't have enough resources to take care of so many children. And what they found was that uh, there were thousands of children in state-run orf uh, orphanages. There was starvation among the children. And because of poor care, uh, AIDS and other diseases were also seen to uh, be common in within those uh, orphanages so really poor outcome and uh, because they were interventions without understanding the real underlying causes now this may look like an isolated story by an inept dictator but in reality we see examples of this all around us all the time now choices Q went from you know being able to ride on a uh, on a van with or being standing sharing a stage with uh, Richard Nixon President Nixon to being executed by a firing squad in his own country really sad state of affairs in this context it's nice to look at a statement by Lewis Thomas in 1974 who said you cannot meddle with one part of a complex system from the outside without the almost certain risk of setting off disastrous events that you hadn't counted on in other remote parts. If you want to fix something, you're first obliged to understand the whole system. Intervening is a way of causing trouble. Okay? Most of the systems we deal with are complex system and Unfortunately, very often, we interfere with these systems in the hope of trying to produce so-called more desirable outcomes. But most of the time, we are impatient. We don't have the intelligence to understand all the implications of what we are trying to do, of our intervention, and we end up making things worse. In fact, in the field of medicine, for example, I have read doctors saying that a lot of the treatment that is given to people, medical treatment that's given to people, is really not treating underlying diseases, but you're treating things that have happened that are resulting because of effects of past treatments. Okay, in other words, somebody had a problem, they went to the doctor, the doctor gave a treatment, and two years down the road, there's something else that has happened, but that's not an underlying problem. It is a result of the prior treatment, right? So what we are trying to do is we have a complex system, for example, the human body or the economy. We do something to it. As a result of what we did, something else happens. We now have to treat that. We try to do something else to it. That results in something else and so on and so forth. So most of what is going on uh, in the world can be seen as really fixing problems that we ourselves caused. So most of the problems we face are the results of solutions from earlier time periods, so-called solutions, which we put in place without fully understanding the system. So in some sense, what we're really saying is that, you know, people who are managing complex systems 
are simply muddling through from problem to problem. So they try to solve something, they create a new problem. They try to solve that, they create yet another problem. And that's what is really going on in many places, unfortunately often. This is an example of how uh, United States dealt with inflation. So you can see from this chart that starting from 68 to 72, inflation was the rate of inflation, the consumer price index that is, was constantly increasing and which is the inflation, uh, which is what is defined as inflation. And you can see here that between 71 and 72, Richard Nixon started taking steps to uh, control this price inflation. So he included price and wage controls, which were really difficult things to do for a Republican president uh, because, you know, Republicans believe in less government intervention, but he was forced to do this to bring, to keep inflation in, under control. And you can see that it did have an impact. It reduced the rate, uh, inflation rate to some extent. And then, of course, we all know what happened to Nixon. He got impeached. Ford came, became the president. Ford continued the campaign with his win campaign, whip inflation now campaign. People did all kinds of things. There was public awareness of uh, inflation and that we need to do something about it, all of that stuff. And that continued to keep inflation below what it, the earlier trajectory. But you can see that by 1975, inflation was back in full swing and continuing along the trend that had earlier been started. So once again, you see a complex system. People are trying to do something to the system, but the system solidly resists any efforts you try to do, uh, put in to change the system. Okay, so that is what we call as policy resistance. Complex systems, no matter what kind of system, you know, business organizations, economic systems, social systems, biological systems, ecological systems, all of these exhibit what is called as policy resistance. Because when you see some feature in any of these systems, that feature is a result of the interaction of several forces. And you need to understand exactly why things are the way they are. What are the underlying forces that keep that system in that kind of a balanced state? Unless you try to understand that any other intervention that you put into place is completely rejected by the system because the underlying causes reassert themselves and the system uh, responds by just negating your your interventions. Okay, so now very often whenever we are faced with explaining why something happened, right? For example, a company had lower than expected profits during a particular quarter or a student is getting a lower than expected academic performance, academic grades, or uh, enrollments in a program at a university are, let's say, lower than expected. Okay. Now, whenever you have these kinds of situations, people, of course, give explanations as to why this happened. Okay. Most of the time, the explanations are what we call as exogenous explanations. That is, explanations that say this happened because of something outside of us, right? So for example, we say, well, our profits came in lower this quarter because raw material prices went up, okay? Or our sales were lower because there was a new competitor. My grades turned out to be poor because the instructor was not good or because, uh, you know, I didn't have time to study. There were so many other activities I had to perform. Okay. Or our enrollments are poor because the economy is bad and people don't want to uh, enroll in college anymore. Those kinds of things. These are all what we call as exogenous explanations. That is explanations that say things happened, bad things happened to us because of something outside of our sphere of control. Another way to explain things is what we call as endogenous explanations. 
that is explanations that say well things happen to us because of some things within our own system that's an endogenous explanation surprisingly often we find that endogenous explanations better explain what actually happened exogenous explanations are more like putting the blame on somebody else something outside of our control endogenous explanations actually say well you know what things happened because of what we did in the past or things happened the way they did because of how we are organized okay not because of something that happened outside of our control in some sense endogenous explanations take responsibility they offer us a better option to improve to take corrective steps because we can make changes in our system that cause the problem to go away that cause our systems to behave differently okay that's a very important insight i think it's probably one of the key insights that we need to take away from systems thinking which is to say most of the time problem explanations for undesirable outcomes are endogenous we can find reasons for why we didn't achieve whatever we wanted to achieve we can find reasons which were actually within our control very rarely are exogenous explanations meaningful or valid this is a key insight so let's say for example i'm giving an example here of exogenous explanations and how people typically react so let's say a company wanted to have 100 million in sales they ended up with 80 million and so there's a 20 million shortfall so that's the event that they're observing that the sales were not as expected or as desired so then they start taking steps typically companies would do things like reduce the price uh, fire the vp of sales increase advertising etc etc and of course there might be a short term impact of some of these steps but of course those short term impacts would be short term mainly because others are going to respond okay the your competitors are going to do something and therefore uh, you're back in the war of trying to do something okay so that's a typical way in which people react to things that happen okay this is what we call as an event oriented world view we have goals there is a situation that happens so there's a problem problem basically being the discrepancy between the goals that we have and the reality we take decisions now based on the event that occurred and the decisions produce results but the decisions also produce other actions or okay, other actions by other actors within the scenario and those may tend to negate whatever results we achieved as a result of the decision okay so here we are going to look at a pyramid of how we can view a situation right how we can react to an event or how we can i would say respond to an event okay so uh, at one level you've got the view that says okay what happened sales came down lower than expected profits came down lower than expected enrollments were not as we wanted them to be okay or my grades are not as good as they could have been or as good as i wanted them to be okay so one way is to view things in terms of events and take actions based on events another is to go slightly deeper and look at trends or patterns okay not simply what happened now but what has been happening over time what is the trend what is the pattern okay so that's a slightly deeper view of uh, understanding what's going on as a basis for taking action a third way is to try and understand well what are the underlying patterns within our organization or within the system that we are talking about what are the underlying connections right 
what are the relationships between the various entities how are they interrelated how are they connected and it is those connections and interactions and policies within the system that are giving rise to the observed patterns and trends right so in other words we are not simply looking at trends and patterns and trying to extrapolate from those trends and patterns we are really trying to understand well how is the structure of the underlying system causing the observed behavior right so the observed behavior is happening because of the way the system is organized because of the various components how they are related how the people uh, or entities within the system think and react that is all all of that causes the observed behavior and therefore we could take an action corrective action perhaps by understanding the underlying structure of the system and finally we can look at what are the mental models meaning what are the basic fundamental assumptions that people have about how things should be and how things are and of course that fundamental those fundamental assumptions is what led us to organize the system in the first place the way we did and that is leading to behaviors okay so we call uh, taking corrective actions based solely on events we call that as a reactive behavior you're simply reacting to what you're observing the next level looking at patterns and trends and then taking corrective action is more like anticipating okay that is we are saying okay this is what has been happening and based on the trend i believe that this is what going is going to happen in the future and therefore i'm going to take an action based on my anticipation okay so for example you may say well sales have been increasing consistently over the several last several years so my reaction is going to be things look healthy i'm going to build a new plant to increase my capacity right or sales have been declining my reaction is going to be i want to uh, you know prop up sales i'm going to reduce the price i'm going to increase advertising or could be that this change in sales you believe is permanent so you start shutting down your factories things like that right so that is anticipating based on patterns and trends that you have observed now the third level is to say well you know what this the behavior we are observing is coming as a result of the structure of the underlying system so if i want things to change then i redesign my system that is i make a change fundamental change to the underlying structure of things are connected uh, of how things are connected and when i make that change i expect that the way the system is going to respond would be now different okay so you're changing how the underlying system is structured and organized and we call that as a design approach to handling any problems you're looking at the underlying structure of the system making changes and thereby trying to get an impact finally of course we can say well all these things are happening because of the way we are thinking because we are thinking that these are the underlying rules right that this is what is important and we are all operating based on that kind of thinking let us change the thinking and then see what happens okay so that's a very fundamental change in the underlying thought process okay and that is called transformation okay so these are different approaches to facing up to any problems that you that you see okay and of course uh, in terms of long lasting impacts of a change the the deeper you go the more you're likely to be able to have an impact on the system right that is changing the underlying mental models will have a much greater leverage than reacting to a short term event okay so if you want to make fundamental changes in the system you have to really start looking at the system deeper and deeper and the deeper you are able to go the more you will be able to make a more fundamental long lasting impactful change on the system okay i think this is a very useful pyramid and whenever we are trying to solve a problem uh, it might be a good idea to really think about 
what level am I really attacking this problem from? Okay, so let's take an example of, okay, my, uh, my grades didn't come out well this time. Okay, and therefore I have a problem. So one thing could be, okay, uh, my score on the last test was not good. So what should I do? Uh, maybe I study better for the next test. Alternately, uh, I go and fight with the professor and say, you didn't grade it properly, regrade my exam and things like that. Right? Or you look at the trend and say, okay, my trend has been that my grades have been falling, not only in this one course, but in every other course. Okay? Uh, so maybe I can think that if I really do nothing, then the same trend is going to continue. So I need to uh, do something to fix the problem. Okay? So that's the other thing. So maybe I need to work harder. I need to, uh, you know, cut down on, uh, you know, uh, time that I spend playing video games and convert that into uh, study time and so on. Okay. Or we look at the underlying structure of the system and say, why is it that my grades are shrinking? Is it simply because I'm not putting in enough time? Or is it because, you know, fundamentally, I'm studying with a view to just memorizing Am I not really understanding what's going on? Okay, uh, or I might look at my earlier exams and see in what are the what are the ways in which I lost points. Okay, maybe I'm not understanding deeply what's happening, or maybe it is, uh, you know, how I'm connected. You know, who are the people I move around with? What are their habits? You know, how is it? Uh, how are they influencing me? Uh, perhaps I need to rethink all of that, and uh, really reorganize how I do things. You know, when I get up, when I exercise, uh, you know, when I study, all of those things. So that is going further and looking deeper. And finally, of course, looking at what are my mental models? What, what do I believe leads to good grades? Okay. Uh, maybe I'm not looking at it the right way. Maybe I'm thinking that uh, getting good grades simply involves, you know, just doing the bare minimum to to be able to fulfill everything. Just complete the assignment. Somehow complete the assignment on time and get it done. Uh, somehow get through class and so on. Right? Maybe my mental model should focus more on saying I need to gain a deeper understanding of things. I need to, uh, you know, in order to really understand something, it's not just memory, but I need to be able to apply it to something. So maybe whenever I learn a new concept, I try and apply it in three or four different ways. Right? Maybe I deepen my understanding by talking to others about it, trying to explain to other people about it, maybe trying to help other people with their homework, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you can see here that we are making deeper and deeper, uh, uh, we are looking at the problem from a deeper and deeper perspective. And of course, the kinds of changes that I spoke about in terms of mental models changes, obviously, would be much more long-lasting. So that's the idea of how you look at a system from many different levels.